I'm AJ Bianco, host of Reflect Ed, a part of the Education Podcast Network. Just like the show you're listening to now, shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to episode 121 of the Google Teacher Podcast, your source for the latest Google for Education news, tips, tricks, and ideas you can use in class tomorrow. I'm Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. And I'm Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about how we can support students and families with Google Sites. It's this great kind of blank canvas where we can provide all sorts of resources, whether you are doing remote learning, hybrid learning, face-to-face learning. We're going to talk about some ways that you can use it. We've also got some Google News and updates. Of course, we've got the mailbag where we're going to hear from you and some things on our blog. So let's get right into it. Are you ready, Casey? Let's go. Hey, y'all, let's dig into some Google news and updates. So (laughs) Casey is just always so happy about the Google updates, y'all. You have so many things at your fingertips and Google's always changing things. And they have introduced something brand new called Google Workspace. And there's a couple of different posts we'll have in the show notes. One is from the keyword blog, and then there's one from G Suite Updates that gets a little more detailed. And so from my understanding, this is now replacing what we call G Suite. So G Suite is now Google Workspace, which means Casey's got to go change a million different things. Yay. And uh, yeah, shout out to Stella Pollard for tagging me on Twitter to remind me of all the changes that are coming. I don't know if I'm excited about this. They Their claim is this is going to be a deeply integrated user experience. I thought it was already pretty integrated, but they're going to have a new brand identity. So I guess they're trying to shift the way people look at this. But I have a few issues with this besides the fact that uh, it requires me to update a lot of resources. But it does say it's coming to education in the coming months. So I don't think we're going to see it as quickly as basic business and enterprise customers. So... Um, one thing that I have an issue with is the fact that they're calling it workspace. Why do we call our school space or something else? I feel like we're using business products for school and we need more differentiation from Google to, to give us that. And the other thing is they're changing the icons from what I can tell. And they're all multicolored. They're all mm-hmm. the Google rainbow. And I don't know about you, but the colors help me differentiate and it helps me differentiate resources. So everybody knows when they see yellow, I'm talking about Google Slides. You know, when you see green, that's sheets. When you see the blue, it's docs. And so for me, mixing and matching those icons is also going to be a little bit more confusing. And for our students, I don't think anybody thinks about how visually we have to direct, especially our younger students to identify those icons. So um, I'm not super excited about this one. No, yeah, I, I've I've seen a lot of uh, things that I'm not super thrilled about as well. I read an article that talked about how this was yet another attempt by Google to try to be more competitive with um, Microsoft Office in some ways. And so, you know, I I get that, but it's like, don't... And th- this is another issue, a bigger issue that I have with Google too, is that it seems like a lot of times they take products that already exist and then they create new products that are similar to that in this, you know, in similar space and try to, I don't know if they're trying to like redo what they've already done. I was just telling Casey, I noticed that there's now Google TV in addition to YouTube TV. Um, they've done this with video chat products like a million times. So I'm not I'm not sure like some some decisions like this just don't make a whole lot of sense to me. And as far as the icons, Casey, what you were saying there, that makes a whole lot of sense to me, especially, you know, also when you look in your tabs and when you look in your bookmarks, they have those little um, those little bitty icons. And if they're all rainbow shapes, then it's going to be just like you said, it's going to be even harder. So I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see how this one all pans out. So um, 
We just recently had World Teachers Day. And if you haven't seen it out on the keyword blog on uh, Google's, well, Google's blog, the keyword, uh, they have a fun little video. There's a post that says this year teachers have gone the distance. And so it shows in this little one minute video, it shows all sorts of different things teachers have done to support their students whenever they've been at home or in these hybrid learning environments or, um, you know, through social distancing or whatever. And then they spotlight a handful of teachers do, that have done really cool things. Uh, for instance, there's a teacher in South Korea that created this learning hub uh, to bring teachers and students together. And it says within two months, the site achieved over 20 million views and was serving 100,000 daily users. So you know, talk about coming through in a time when everybody needed some help. And then there's Jennifer Scott, uh, Jennifer Scott from California, who I have gotten to meet and I've gotten to talk to her about this. Um, she has used Google Slides to create her junior high school's annual yearbooks and have been able to sell them for just $10. Like the whole thing is laid out in Google Slides and then they provide it to a, a local printer. And so they just kind of highlight some of the neat things that, that teachers are doing. And it's always interesting to see you know, what other people are doing to get inspiration for yourself. And those are some great resources. There have been some really good things that have come out of this yeah. crisis. So I, I have said that a lot over the last few months, but I am really happy that we have these resources to help teachers and uh, that we're trying to do it on this podcast as well. So kind of going back to what you said earlier, Matt, about how Google just kind of like makes these other iterations of products sometimes mm -hmm. i feel like tasks kind of falls under that you know we've got google keep and then we've also got google tasks and i don't know why these two have not merged yet it, and they are different but i feel like maybe there's a way because i feel like people use them for a lot of the same reasons but one of the new things that just launched is the ability to create and view tasks in the google calendar mobile app it's not huge, but I think this is still pretty important for those of you who like to use tasks and to see those on your calendar and to be able to do that in one place. So on the G Suite Updates blog, there is a little animation that you can see on how you can add that task and add the due date. And if it's a repeating task, all of those things right there. And to be able to view that in your calendar is super handy as well. So I have to have a to-do list manager in my life or I don't show up for podcast recordings <laughs> and things like that. Yeah, no, I, I totally get you. I'm, I'm exactly the same way. And I, that's really interesting that you mentioned that about Keep. Um, it seems like, this is just my general feeling about this, it seems like there are certain things that are really important to Google that aren't as necessarily important to a lot of us. And then there feels like there are things, and again, this may just be my own personal view and bias on the world, but there are things that seem like they're more important to us than maybe they're to Google. And I feel like Keep is maybe one of those things where anybody I know that has seen Keep, you know, for the most part, a lot of them see a lot of value in it, but it's not something that you see, you know, Google really pushing. But then you have something like tasks and they're like, oh, let's integrate this everywhere, all over the place. And like Casey said, I know some of you use tasks, but, you know, it's not as big of a deal to me. Um, I don't know. And I, I like what you say there about how maybe there's a place, maybe there's a place to integrate those two together. So maybe somebody is listening to this and maybe they'll follow through on yeah, it. Yeah. Well, all three are now integrated across like Docs, Sheet Slides, Gmail, everywhere. You have those three mm -hmm. little icons, Calendar, oh, yeah. Keep, and Tasks. So, yeah. I, but I just feel like there's so much overlap between those last two that we need like a, a Keep at Keep Tasks or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, well be careful no, because then it's it gonna, something I hate. It'll be like keep me tasks. It'll be like keep me <laughs> task cow and it'll, like go, all come together as one yeah. ridiculous thing. Let's not give them mm -hmm. ideas. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no more ideas. No, I agree. All right. We got one more thing to share real quick. Um, 
This has to do with Google Meet. Uh, no comments on meats and mystery meats and <laughs> all of that. You know us. Um, but this one says increase engagement with Q&A and polls in Google Meet. And starting October 8th, if you have, let me go on down here to the availability. If you have G Suite Essentials, G Suite Business, G Suite Enterprise, and or G Suite Enterprise for Education, you're going to get these features. These features are pretty nice if you're using Google Meet on a regular basis. And that includes a Q&A where, you know, the people that are in on your video calls can put out a question and then you can respond to it and people can rank them with a uh, thumbs up. So the, you know, the most thumbed up ones go to the top. But then you've also got polls too. You could create a poll with a question and different options and then they get to choose. And the big thing to know, I think, on this, and some of you are aware of this by now, but remember that, <laughs> here's the PSA again, remember that G Suite for education is not the same as G Suite Enterprise for education. Enterprise is like the premium version, and this uh, these Q&A features and these polls are the ones that are going to be available for that. So um, if you've got... Ooh. I know. I know. If you've got enterprise, then those are coming and those will be nice. But I also have to say, like, you know, Q&A and polls to me don't seem like, boy, Casey, we're on fire today. We're like <laughs> shooting down all of these <laughs> ideas right and left, left and right. Or, um, yeah, yeah. But um, I, I don't feel like these are that game changing of things because with a Q&A, you can ask questions in the chat. With polls, you could shout out a poll in a video call and have everybody respond in the comments. Like you can do a lot of these things in the in the chat, and it, you, you don't necessarily need these bells and whistles. So to me, these are not that game changing of changes. I think is this is just Google trying to play catch up with yeah. Zoom and with other other yeah. platforms. They're just trying to compete in um, with a paid platform. So th that's it. So. That's a mouthful of updates. There's so many things going on and so many things have happened over the last few months, but hopefully these will help you as you continue to plan and work with your students to know that these things are coming your way. And you can access the links to all the information about these updates in our show notes at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 121. So as this year continues to move forward, a lot of us are still in these remote learning environments where you know we're still not face to face with our students. Uh, we've got some schools that are. In fact, the school district where my kids go to school are uh, face to face and taking all of the the you know protocols and the procedures and the precautions. But then we've also got, of course, the hybrid situations where we've got some students that are home and some students that are face to face and everything. And um, one of the constants that, that seems to come to the surface when it comes to all of these is the ability to access information. And I don't mean just, you know, like teaching and learning and that kind of thing, but, but really the idea of communicating and keeping everybody up to speed and everybody on the same page. Email is one way that we do that. And that's one thing that I think everybody has noticed is it seems like our volume of emails has gotten crazy during the pandemic. But um, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. And there is one Google tool that can really help us to keep everybody on the same page um, on demand at a moment's notice, and that's Google Sites. And it's been really interesting to watch as teachers have created sites uh, to keep everybody on the same page. And that could mean keeping students on the same page, but also keeping parents on the same page, too. And so, uh, you know, Google Sites is probably a tool that you've, you're very familiar with. And the idea of putting some sites out there to keep everybody connected and keep everybody up to date is not a groundbreaking one, but it's definitely one I think that's worth revisiting because there are a lot of very helpful, very useful things that we can put onto a site that can help students and can help parents. 
Yeah, I love Google Sites. It's so easy to use. And in fact, I think it's easier than a lot of the teacher website creators out there. And it's great for students to use and create as well. So it's a natural fit for getting resources out and in a single one-stop shop very, very easily. And I love the idea of creating a special resource page for students and probably a separate one for parents when you create those pages in in Google Sites because we do have different resources we want to send each of those to, especially depending on the age. But if you've got high parental involvement and still doing home learning, that's definitely something to consider and to make those, you know, very clear and near the top of your menu and your Google site. A lot of things that I would consider including for resources. And Keep in mind, you may also want to link to this site in Google Classroom and put that right at the top. So you're not putting 20 million links at the top of Google Classroom and then it's all messy. Just link to that one stop shop. Go send them to the site. Um, I have those Google Classroom cheat sheets. There's one set for uh, teachers. And there's another shorter set for students. And I can tell you, I've been asked, I don't know how many times, why don't I make one for parents? Well, guess what? Parents don't have a login. So there's not actually a parental view into Google Classroom at this time. If they're logging in, they're probably logging in as their student. So the student one may also be for parents. So that is something that is great and handy if you're using Google Classroom with your students so that they have that little reference guide. And those are completely free. I've got the link to those in my show notes at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 121. The other thing that Matt actually mentioned earlier is that Teach From Anywhere site. It was Teach From Home originally when, when we went into this home learning environment, but Google has put together a lot of resources in one place. So whether you link directly just to that site or you find other resources there that would be great for students or parents. And there's one particular resource that I have stumbled on a few times that Google made, and it's called Google's Guide for Guardians. And it's a PDF document that just talks about what all this Google stuff is in a parental language. And so that's another thing that would be great to link on that parent resource page to help them understand, because I have seen countless conversations online, a lot in the Shake Up Learning Facebook group about does anybody have a slide deck on how to explain this to parents? Does anybody have, there's a lot of this, how do we tell parents what this means? And so I'm glad that that's there as a resource. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. You know, I think another useful resource to have for parents is to embed videos that support what you're teaching in class, you know, um, whether you're teaching remotely or if it's hybrid or if you're fa really, if you're face to face too, and um, you know, if you're in one of those situations where life is starting to get a little bit more back to, to normal, um, having that out there is great for parents to have in the first place. Um, you know, a lot of times, and I can say this being the parent of three kids, ninth grade, seventh grade, fifth grade, you know, kind of, kind of like the, the whole gamut there, high school, middle school, elementary school, um, that whenever they're working on homework or we're going back over something that they've done in class and I'm trying to help them out or I'm trying to help them think through something, sometimes shocking, ready for this? Sometimes I don't remember exactly how I was taught that when I was in school. <laughs> Either the, pr I know, I know the procedure of how the teacher teaches that particular thing or just the general concept of it in my brain. And so what's nice is instead of me going, well, gee, I don't know how to do that. Let's look it up. And then I go look up some resource and they teach it differently or there is a little bit of different nuance on it. Why don't we just put something like that in a video, either a simple video that you can create yourself, you know, just shooting it with your camera or using you know, a simple video tool like Flipgrid or Screencastify. You make some of those videos and you put them out there. If you don't have time for that, which is fine, um, go find something that articulates it in the way that you do in your own style. And it's kind of like a, you know, a trusted resource that is similar. And you start to create this little library of videos. And now all of a sudden you're equipping and empowering parents and students to go find answers to those questions so that they don't have to stumble around in the dark. Um, 
And I think that can be really helpful, like Casey was saying, and I'm so glad that you made this distinction. Um, if you make a site for students and if you make a site for parents, you know, those are the kinds of things that you can definitely put out there. And of course, with parents too, you start to think about the kinds of videos that you could make available to them. You could make specific ones from you talking about, you know, unique, important things that they need to know. Um, it could also be just general guidance. You know, if you're a math teacher, what are some ways that you can bring math into what you do at home? Uh, if you're an elementary teacher and you want to, you, you've got kind of a focus on social emotional learning, maybe you give parents some tips on those kinds of things. Um, you know, just making that stuff available, I know, can be super, super helpful. And whenever you create these resource sections, um, Casey mentioned this a little bit. Um, you know, they, they become a link that you can provide to those parents or provide to those students out to the Google site from your Google Classroom. And I think that's an important distinction because sometimes we'll look at Google Classroom and we'll expect it to be the one-stop shop where you can put everything. And you certainly can put everything there. What Google, Google Classroom isn't made to do some of the things that Google Sites is. And so if you provide that link out to the site where you can have you know, a little bit better design, where you can organize a little bit differently, where you can embed documents and you can embed videos in a way that you can't in Google Classroom, that kind of almost stretches the capabilities and possibilities of Google Classroom. So lots and lots of stuff you can do with Sites. This is, this is good stuff. If anyone was listening from Google, which I doubt they are, it would be yeah. fantastic to integrate sites and classroom. How yes. awesome would it be if we had a public forward facing part of Google Classroom mm -hmm. built on Google Sites that then connected everything together um, so that we weren't kind of building these two separate things. And I do think that's kind of the missing piece inside classroom is the ability to design it in a way that you want, like we can in sites and to create those extra resource pages. You know, there's so many workarounds that we've developed in the topics and the organization, but it just, it's not a web, it's not a website with the regular type of menu. So having that would be fantastic. If I get a wish list today, that's on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other thing too, Matt, you know, we're talking about having both the Google Classroom and the site running. But also, if teachers will collaborate across campus to do this consistently for your students, that will help out parents and, and other students oh, as yeah. well. So if students, if students attend multiple classes and have multiple teachers who are doing things a million different ways, that's even more confusing. And then, of course, for parents and, of course, even more so for parents of multiple students <laughs> that, you know, like you were talking about the emails, I've seen so many posts this year from parents who talk about how many hours it takes them to read all the emails from all the teachers and trying to get an understanding of what actually is happening. So if we can streamline that process, if we can work together to, to do things in a similar way, that would be fantastic. If your school is not already organizing teacher websites in a way that you go to the school website and then you can click to see all the teacher websites and have all of those linked in one place. That is, of course, a huge way to get this organized in a format that would be more useful to parents and students, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. You know, and speaking of organization, too, um, there's there's yet another way to um you know, to take some of the information that you want to get out to parents and students and to make your life a little bit easier, um, especially cut back on a little bit of the email. Uh, this is something that I've seen some teachers do that I think is brilliant. And that's the idea of creating a frequently asked questions document or an FAQ. And this can be done in a variety of different ways. But really, the simplest way to do it, I think, is to just create a document. Just start with a simple document and start to think about what are some questions that parents might ask. Or, you know, we could also have a different document that's student facing for a particular assignment or for the entire year. See, this this whole idea of a frequently asked questions document uh, could take a lot of different forms. And so you start to preload it with some questions that you think that they may ask. And then if they do send you an email or if they do ask 
um, that question, you can say, oh, hey, that's covered in the FAQ. You can go take a look at that, uh, which can potentially save you some time. And of course, once they get used to the FAQ being out there, maybe they'll go check it out instead of asking you the question, um, which is kind of the point of having those kinds of documents. And then in addition to that, whenever you get a question from a student or if you get a question from a parent and it's the kind of question that somebody else might have, guess what? You answer it once, you copy that answer, you stick it onto the FAQ, and now it's available to everyone. So that's the kind of thing you could certainly post on a student-facing Google site, on a parent-facing Google site, or you could even just stick it in the classwork page of your Google Classroom. That's certainly one other thing. And then you know, other other just general things that you could put into a Google site that I think could be helpful. You could always do a Google form that could serve kind of like a contact form um, that allows parents or students to be able to reach out with to you. I know in some situations, uh, students have a Google login that isn't tied to email. And so being able to contact teachers through that can be tricky. So it could be a way around that. You could always take pictures of, you know, whiteboard illustrations uh, and stick those onto the site, um, important documents like permission slips and a syllabus or whatever, um, you know, just a variety of different things. I've even seen teachers use Google Sites to hold digital escape rooms. I know we're, we're kind of branching away from what we're talking about here, but I, that really is one of the coolest ways I've found. Um, I've actually had a link on our show notes to a place where you can go check out how to build these digital escape rooms. That's, of course, at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 121. But um, yeah, lots and lots of different things that we can put onto these Google Sites. And I love the FAQ idea. There is definitely a need for that. That's where you put the that question that you were so sick of answering yes. over and over again. That is the beauty of technology, whether it's kids who are asking that question over and over again about an assignment, put that in the assignment instructions and save yourself some headache, but also those parent questions, which are lingering. So um, love that idea. Another thing that you may be doing if you're still doing some hybrid or remote learning is hosting virtual office hours. And I've talked enough about this to know that everybody doesn't automatically know what that means when I say that. So let me explain a little bit. Hosting virtual office hours means you set up a time where you're going to be online and available, whether that's Google Meet, Zoom, whatever you're using, and students can come in and out and ask questions. It's been really useful. It's something that... I I've done for years in a distance learning course and online course teachers do this a lot, but doing this in our K-12 environment can be very helpful too for students. And just to make sure that everyone knows when you're available, one idea is to add an image header in Google Sites, create that image, say in Google Drawings and put your office hours on there, mm, like just as yeah. part of the image so that it's at the top of the, of every single page and everyone knows when you're available. So there's no questions about that. And, um, you know, there's some pros and cons. If you want to include your, your link or anything like that, you might just want to say, go to Google classroom and you'll find the link or something like that. So you're not posting that to everywhere, but, um, just a quick tip that you can add information to that image header. And that has come in handy. You know, a lot of teachers really liked when Google classroom gave us that ability to see the meet link in the header. And I can't tell you how many have asked me to add other things. <laughs> Casey, how do I put my Zoom link up there? Casey, how do I do this? And you can put it in the image. One thing to remember, that image is going to shrink on a mobile device and stretch out on a desktop. So you probably want to put that near the middle. It may not be the prettiest place to put it, but you're you're just got to keep in mind it's going to get distorted a little bit as that is a... Um, website that adjusts based on the size of the screen. Another tidbit <laughs> that we've learned the hard way, I feel like, with this idea of hybrid learning or concurrent classes, which y'all, I don't know if, if anybody heard my rant. I, I kind of went on a rant. It was a little bit um, out of my normal um, type of podcast episodes, but I got pretty upset in defense of teachers at some of the things that they're having to do. But if you are in the situation where you're running your online classroom with your face-to-face -face classroom, 
a lot of teachers are now giving them specific group names. So, you know, you're blue and you're silver or, you know, they've got animal names or whatever it is to differentiate the two. That's also something that you can consider differentiating on the Google site, whether that's a completely different site or maybe just different pages so that because you're, they're not doing the exact same things. You, you just can't do it that way. So we have to find ways to support those in those two different groups. And I hate that that's double the work, but that is something else that might save you some time in the long run. Lots of different things that we can do related to Google Sites here. Hopefully, you've come away with a couple of quick tips or some ideas that you can use. Of course, we're always fascinated to hear what you are doing and what ideas you have, too. So um, please do head to googleteacherpodcast.com and leave us some feedback or drop it onto the GT Pod hashtag on social media. Um, and of course, with any of these things we've talked about, if you want to check out any of the links, you can head to our show notes at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 121. There's a letter in your mailbox. Hey, you know what? This is all your mail. Hey, maybe I'll give you a call sometime. You've got mail. Hey, Matt, is this the first time we're going to jump in the mailbag? I think we Yay! didn't do mailbag. It is the first time. It's the first time we've had been in the mailbag in a while yes. since, since the... Since the last season. So we mm -hmm. had a lot of things happening in the mailbag. And unfortunately, we can't put them all on today's episode. But I have a speak pipe message here from Cheryl Brennan. And she is a Google certified teacher in California, or no trainer. That's she's a Google certified trainer in California that doesn't exist anymore in California. And she is commenting on the update that we mentioned in episode 120 about the to do widget that was added into Google Classroom. And she's got some great tips. So take it away, Cheryl. Hi, Matt and Casey. My name is Cheryl Brennan, and I am a Google certified trainer out here in California. And this year I am back in the classroom and it's, um, Super exciting that I'm getting to implement all the Google tools that I've been teaching and preaching over the last seven years. I am responding into episode um, 120 where you mentioned the to-do widget in Google Classroom. I totally use this with my students. I use it to redirect them if they ever ask what um, are they supposed to be doing or if they're finished with something, I said, check your to-do list, check your to-do list. And if their to-do list is empty, they know that they can do their may-do list. I also noticed today that there's a different view of the same thing, the, the list of their assignments from within the classroom. So if you go inside the classroom and you go to the classwork tab, there's a view your work widget. And I actually like that view a little bit better. And so I might mention that one to my kids that they can see clearly um, the, the assignments that they're missing. So that's another view that you might want to check out. Thank you for being back on. I'm really excited to be listening to your uh, episodes every other week now. Love hearing this from the teacher's perspective and how she's operating and using that language with students, too. I think that's really important in how we're differentiating and telling students how to use that tab and to make sure that they get to do all of those things. Um, I like that she's differentiating her must do and her may do list so they can't move on until they've cleared out that to do widget in Google Classroom. Fantastic tips there. So thank you, Cheryl. Uh, the next one we've got comes from Mary Lynn from Reno, Nevada. And she's got a question about doing face-to-face -face learning with remote learning all together. So go ahead, Mary Lynn. Hi, this is Miss Lynn. I'm Mary Lynn. I'm from Reno, Nevada. I teach at a private school and I've been listening to your podcast for almost a year now. So I'm going to have go back in the building and I'm going to be teaching one student remotely and I need some help on how I can do that with Google Meet. I guess I'm going to have two cameras in the room, and then I'll have my other students in the room, and then I'll have one little girl that's going to be just doing a Google Meet all day with me. I don't know if that's the best thing to do. So I just wanted some feedback from you guys because I really like your podcast and um, just wanted some tips from the pros. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is again, one of those tricky, rough situations. And 
again, like like we were saying earlier, we're super curious to hear what your solutions to this have been, how you've been handling it. But I think there are a couple of things that you can do if you have, you know, like Mary Lynn, one student who's remote or a handful of students who are remote. And so, um, of course, you could you could do that, you know, long video call where students are supposed to be right there at their computer. But, you know, that just sounds brutal to me. Um, and so what we might <laughs> think about doing, yeah, I know we could, that's a whole, that's a whole other topic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. What we could, what we could consider doing is instead of doing that, we could think about, you know, what are the benefits of being on a live video call and what are the benefits of recording? So, you know, for instance, instead of doing that video call where the student is just kind of like monitoring what's going on in the class the whole time, what if you had kind of like a face-to-face video call with that student instead to answer their specific questions to give them whatever they need? And then what if we just record the parts of class where you know, the, the parts of class that that student really does need to see, you know, so if there's a little bit of direct instruction going on, if there's a discussion going on, you know, any of that stuff, if we just record those specific parts, then they don't have to sit through the whole thing. I think that's maybe one strategy that could, you know, that could potentially help. But again, like we were saying, it'll be really interesting to hear um, what you all are doing. So if you get an opportunity to kind of share with us uh, what your solutions are to this, please do head to googleteacherpodcast.com and let us know because we'd be, we'd really love to, to be able to share that with everyone else. All right, we're just about through this episode 121. So we're going to share just a couple of quick blog posts that you can check out, and then we will be on our way. So I've got a couple of them to tell you about. For one, I just recently published a guest blog post by Esther Park, who's doing some really neat things with Google Meet. She has uh, figured out a way to create something that kind of almost looks like breakout rooms for differentiated learning. And, you know, the idea behind this, she makes this fun little graphic with a bunch of different doors. Her example is that she's created uh, what she calls a teacher help room an open group room, a quiet group room, and then a quiet room. And so the idea behind this is to create different learning environments within these Google Meet uh, video calls. And students get to pick which one they want to jump into. And so, uh, you know, of course, each one has its different norms so that, you know, there's different levels of noise and interactivity and everything. And basically, all she's doing here is creating video call links and hyperlinking them so that it's easy for students to be able to join them. Thought it was really, really smart. So if you've been looking for a way to make that happen, you might check out that post. And then I've also got another one. This one's called 12 Social Media Inspired Google Slides Templates. This is the idea that we can pull from some of those apps and websites that students love, some of those social media, and use the idea behind them to create some really fun uh, lesson ideas and activities. And so there are 12 different downloadable Google Slides templates. I just added a brand new one that was a Yelp review template and a Spotify playlist template. There's a YouTube one on there. There's a Netflix one created by Nick Lefave. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can go check out. You can go, of course, file, make a copy of these and save them to your Google Drive and then push them out to your students. I think that they'll love them. Those are fantastic. And those have been so popular. I know the idea of mimicking the app idea, especially with social media, is is fun and engaging for students. So I'm so glad you have those templates available. I've got three quick hits for you. Just put out a new podcast and blog post on synchronous versus asynchronous online learning just to give us some more words into our vegetable soup. (laughs) So many things that everybody's talking about. And these two words uh, have been in my world for a long time, but I realized that for the classroom teacher, this is not necessarily something they are as familiar with. And I caught some posts online from teachers who obviously didn't understand what these words meant. And so I decided to put something together. Um, There's also some 
ideas and strategies and tools, kind of how we do this. And then I updated a really old blog post. I think I published this the first year I started blogging, but collaborative notes with Google Docs got a refresh and some ideas on ways you can get students taking notes together. Together. What? Yes, together. And um, in case I, I don't even remember if I shared this in the last episode, but I do have two new books coming out before the end of the year. Fingers crossed. Uh, one of them is called Blended Learning with Google, and the other one is called Google A to Z. So they are very googly for you folks. And I've got a link in the show notes, but you can also go to blendedlearningwithgoogle.com to sign up to be the first to know about the release dates, bonuses, and all the goodies that are coming your way. Oh my goodness. Those are going to be amazing. I got to get my hands on that pretty quick. So um, of course, if you want to get to any of that stuff, you can head to our show notes at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 121. Okay, y'all, it is time to wrap things up. And we hope you have enjoyed this episode. There have been so many different scenarios thrown at teachers this year, and we are doing our best to help you. So keep the questions coming. And that helps us to learn from you and share with more teachers. Yeah, Uh, we're super excited to get to be with you in this episode again this week. And we will see you on the next episode of the Google Teacher Podcast. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Podcast. Never miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts and by visiting our website, googleteacherpodcast.com. Join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTPod. Until next time, keep harnessing that G Suite power and may the Googles be with you. I had something in my teeth. Sorry. <laughs> Nobody can see, see it, it, but I can feel it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>